This episode will be using adult language and discusses sensitive and potentially triggering topics including violence, abuse, and murder. This episode may not be appropriate for younger audiences. All parties are innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Some names have been changed or omitted per their request or for safety purposes. Listener discretion is advised. Hola, my beautiful humans. This is Jasmine Castillo. And I bring stories and cases from the people of color community, bringing awareness of murdered and missing indigenous women, girls, two spirits, the LGBTQ community, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black indigenous people of color. These are their stories. So welcome to Hands Off, my podcast. Part 1. Hispanic Heritage. Tu sin nombre. Are nameless. In honor of National Hispanic Heritage Month, I wanted to bring to the forefront our Hispanic, Latinx, Indigenous, Jane and John Doe's, and wanted to thank the DNA Doe Project in putting them in the spotlight. Even though this is just a handful of thousands that are unidentified, or tu sin nombre, in the NamUs website, Let alone, there are a whole other list of people that are considered unclaimed. I hope to talk of their stories in the near future. Tu sin nombre. They are special cases. They present numerous challenges to many groups and teams that are currently working on them. And it is important to bring this social justice issue to light. And one of the ones that I want to give props to is the DNA Doe Project. They are a national nonprofit, and they seek to identify John and Jane Doe's using genetic genealogy and hoping to identify them and let them rest with their grieving families. These are their stories. Ventura County Jane Doe In the 1980s, Westlake Village, California was considered very rural, a remote place that had lots of farms and ranches in this area. And on July 18, 1980, in this area, janitors at a Westlake High School received a call of a mannequin lying in a parking lot. But when they got closer, it was a young woman who was partially disrobed and stabbed. Her shoes were tossed up the hillside and you could see bloody drag marks in the parking lot. Sheriff's Patrol deputies responded to the call and immediately started their investigation, noticing that these marks of her being dragged through the parking lot as if she was brought there in a car and drugged up on the hillside where she was later found. She wore a light-colored top that was soaked in blood, and it was very evident that she surely did put up a fight and had defensive wounds on her arms and hands. Based on the investigation, Sheriff believed that she had been raped, yet there was no identification, no jewelry. When they did the autopsy, they learned that she had been stabbed 29 times. She was pregnant with a boy who also died. An investigator named Steve Rhodes took over this, Jane Doe cold case, and there was DNA evidence that was collected at that time from the rape kit and from the victim's clothing, which was later submitted to CODIS for analysis, which at that time was considered a newer DNA technique, was possibly abducted from Los Angeles, Kern, Ventura, or Tular County, and it was theorized that she was taken to the scene from a significant distance. She may have been hitchhiking near the College of Sequoias in Visalia, California, yet it is unknown if this theory is originated from a sighting. Later, CODIS got a hit, and finally, after 30 years, they had a match for a suspect, a convicted felon named Wilson Schaust, who was locked away behind bars, serving a life sentence for a string of sexual assaults and also learned that there was a previous CODIS hit for Wilson Schaust to another Jane Doe, but from Kern County, who was later identified as Shirley Suse. There is an extensive story on the history behind Wilson Schaust, but I prefer not to go into details with that, because this episode and all my episodes 
are focused on the victims and not the killer. Shirley was a young woman who was found murdered in 1980 after she was raped, stabbed, and strangled. Fortunately, her murder was solved in 2018. And once Shirley was identified as the Kern County Jane Doe in 2018, Wilson Schaust completely denied knowing their names. And there was recent developments from genealogical research by the DNA Doe Project that uncovered potential surnames and locations of where the victim possibly originated. Also, the DNA Doe Project did release surnames and locations of distant relatives of Ventura County Jane Doe, and it's quite extensive. But the list includes surnames from Southern Texas, which was between San Antonio and Brownsville, and Northeastern Mexico, Central Mexico, Northern New Mexico, and Southern Colorado with Indigenous California and Guatemala. And in 2021, investigators identified the father of her baby as a Honduran immigrant who had ties to the Central American community within the Korea Town District of Los Angeles, but were unable to get any new information from him. Ventura County Jane Doe had brown eyes, pierced ears, black hair dyed blonde at the ends. She was about five months pregnant with a boy. She likely had a child before because she had a pisiotomy scar. She had shaved her natural eyebrows and had pencil brown lines in their place. Her artificial brows were about a quarter inch above the natural location. She was wearing mascara and her nails were painted red. Some birthmarks on her face and a mole below her left index finger. She had a scar on her left knee, along with two vaccination scars on her left arm. She was about 60% Native American with some Hispanic and white ancestry. Additionally, there was a small amount of Asian heritage discovered. She seems to have a grandparent several generations back from England or Ireland. She was wearing a white blouse, a black bra, red corduroy pants, white underwear, and the open toe high heel shoes, which were the ones that were thrown on the hillside nearby. If you have any information about who the Ventura County Jane Doe is, you can contact Ventura County Sheriff's Office Major Crimes Investigations at 805-383-8704, agency case number 80-12246. Broadway Street Phoenix Jane Doe. This Jane Doe was hit and killed by a vehicle just after midnight on 21st November 2004. She was crossing the street near South 15th Street and East Broadway Road. And 18 years later, she is still unidentified. However, forensic genealogists may finally be able to find out this victim's name. Detective Stuart Summer Shu of Phoenix Police Department was able to provide her physical description. A Hispanic female between the ages of 40 and 50 years old, 5 feet 4 inches, short brown hair and brown eyes. On her palm, she had some illegible writing. There was a possible witness that saw the car fleeing from the scene as she left their line on the ground. Broadway Street Phoenix Jane Doe case was taken over by DNA Doe Project with the help of Detective Summer Shu. The victim's blood card was sent to the lab and did an extraction of the DNA, made this into a usable file that can be uploaded into a database called GEDmatch. And with the findings, they were able to build back a family tree, parents that are believed from Colvillo, Aguas Calientes, Mexico. They are still looking for the parents or siblings of this Jane Doe, and they might not even know that they have lost her. People lose contact over families from home when they move to the United States, so maybe this is what her family's thinking, that they just lost touch. But she deserves to have her name back. There is a $5,000 reward from Silent Witness, and if you have any information leading to the arrest or an indictment of suspects of this crime, call Silent Witness. You can also remain anonymous at 
witness. That's 480-948-6377 or toll free at 1-800-343-TIPS. You can also leave a tip on the Silent Witness website at silentwitness.org. Kilgore Jane Doe, also known as Gray County Jane Doe. On December 23, 2000, human remains were found between a railroad track and a creek in the wooded area along Spinks Chapman Road, which is about five miles northeast of Kilgore. She was found wearing a white Adidas shirt with black stripes on the sleeve, blue jeans, white bra and panties, and brown leather shoes originally made from Mexico. A young detective at the time from the Gray County District Attorney, Tom Watson, was assigned to this case for over 20 years. And during that time, they didn't have the DNA technology like today, which made it difficult to identify the skeletal remains or cause of death. And thankfully, this is one of the other cases that the DNA Doe Project took over. She was identified to be aged between 30 to 50 years old. Initially, they had thought that she was African-American, yet DNA results from Parabon Nano Labs, Inc. indicated that she was almost entirely Native American. Authorities believe the woman died sometime between 1999 and 2000. Standing 4 feet to 5 feet 2 inches, weighing about 115 pounds, and according to DNA phenotyping, she likely had black hair, brown or dark eyes, and a light brown complexion. Anyone with information on this Jane Doe or relatives are urged to contact Kilgore Police Department at 903-218-6905. Kings County Jane Doe When I looked this Jane Doe up, I found over 35 Kings County Jane Does. Yes, that's right, 35. And about the same amount of John Does as far back to the 1980s. Today I will discuss about Jane Doe of 2015. On May 13, 2015, Kings County Sheriff deputies received a report of human remains located along the 42,000 block of 6th Avenue in Corcoran. She was an unidentified adult female wrapped in a tarp and dumped along the 6th Avenue where the Homeland Canal in southern Kings County. In the months since discovering her body, investigators have combed through missing persons through the state and even uploaded the victim's DNA into the California Department of Justice database for missing persons. None of these routes produce results for the investigators. And so a forensic anthropologist was called in to conduct an examination of the remains and determined that she is of European descent, most likely more than 60 years old in age, between 5 feet to 5 feet 6 inches tall, with gray or graying blonde hair. It was also discovered that she had no teeth but had been prepped for a full set of upper and lower dentures. She was in an advanced stage of decomposition and had appeared to been deceased for several months. And this is the reason why detectives were unable to recover any fingerprints or any other identifying characteristics. She was wearing a light-colored, horizontally striped t-shirt, black, loose-fitting yoga-type pants, and a Depends-type underwear. The anthropologist also determined that she had severe osteoporosis and believed that she was mobile, but yet she was likely hunched over, and there was a good chance that she was considered bedridden at one time. They also noticed an old fracture of her nose, which resulted in a slight skewing of the nose to the left. An old fracture of the pelvic area was noted as well. Her estimated time of death was somewhere between May 2014 and April 2015. Anyone with any information regarding her case is urged to contact the Kings County Sheriff's Department at 559-852-4554. Tempe Girl Now, with Tempe Girl, she has a very suspicious circumstance around her death. Tempe, Arizona 
April 27, 2002. A shopping mall near the Arizona State University early morning, there was an employee of the shopping mall who was on their way to work. However, before their shift started at around 5.40 a.m., this employee took a walk through the alleyway and came across Tempe Girl, a young woman to be either of Peruvian or Mexican ancestry or Native American descent, was found fully clothed, wearing blue jeans, a red halter top, and underneath she was wearing blue underwear. When the employee found her, she was wearing only one shoe, which was a black slip-on shoe, a three-inch wedge, size six and a half. She had straight shoulder-length black hair, brown eyes, a little scar on her left hand, which was kind of an L-shaped. On her wrist, she had a purple hairband. She weighed roughly around 128 to 225 pounds, 5 foot or 5 foot 2. Her approximate age was between 15 to 19, but probably more closer to 17 years old. Once the employee rang the police and had her body taken for autopsy, they announced that Jane Doe, cause of death, was cocaine intoxication. She had a large amount of cocaine in her system. At first, they thought it was possibly attempt in suicide or maybe just a tragic accident of an addiction. Yet still, the police pushed on to identify her, comparing dental charts, taking her DNA sample and fingerprints. However, they couldn't find any matches in a database. Next to Tempe Girl's body, they discovered a CD compact desk on the ground and they can see from looking at the disc that it had a fingerprint. So the investigators decided to carry out tests to try to trace this fingerprint. They were successful. The print was determined to have come from a woman who was living in the Phoenix, Arizona area, which was about 11 miles away from Tempe, Arizona. When the police were able to track down this woman, questioning her to see if she had a friend or an acquaintance that she had taken into her home and to identify this woman. Unfortunately, this woman did not know who Tempe Girl was, yet the CD did belong to her. Ironically, the last time she saw this CD was in her car. She said that her boyfriend had been using her car just a day before Tempe Jane Doe's body was found. So naturally, the police wanted to speak to this boyfriend just in case he knew anything about who she is and how this CD end up on the ground next to her body. The police were able to investigate and ask further questions to this boyfriend of the woman. And he did admit that yes, he did see this girl. And actually, he was driving his girlfriend's car near an area called Greenway Road in Tempe. When he spotted her hitchhiking, apparently she waved to him and she flagged him down. So he stopped the car and offered her a lift. She accepted. The boyfriend said that she spoke in Spanish and she was telling him that recently she had been kicked out of her home by her family because of her drug addiction. And initially, when she did get into the car, she asked the boyfriend if she could take her to a place that had sold concert tickets because there was a concert coming up and she wanted to attend. However, during her journey, she actually changed her mind and asked if he could drive her somewhere else because instead of buying a concert ticket, she now wanted to use the money to buy drugs. So he followed her directions, and when he arrived at the destination, the boyfriend said that a man got into the car next to Jane Doe and this man was a drug dealer. When he got into the vehicle, there was an exchange of money and cocaine, which she used straight away. However, shortly after this, the drug dealer and this boyfriend witnessed the doe starting to convulse and have seizures. They began to panic, but instead of trying to get her to some hospital for help, they actually drove her to the nearby shopping mall in Tempe. And there, they dragged her out of the car, and they placed her in the alleyway behind the shopping mall, and she was found the next morning by that employee. And when they left her in that alleyway, she died. 
The boyfriend claimed that before he left, he did tell the drug dealer to call 911 so that an ambulance would be sent to the scene. And apparently, according to a couple of online sources, a call to 911 was made from a nearby gas station. But the 911 operator that answered couldn't actually work out what the person on the other line was saying. So the emergency services weren't sent to the scene. I don't believe that the drug dealer that sold the cocaine to her was actually traced and identified so the police couldn't get additional information to coincide with this boyfriend's story. If you have any information on who she is, or please contact the Tempe Police Department at 480-350-8311, case number 0206-7577. Tom Green County John Doe, not to be confused with John Doe II, whom was found on December 2, 1996. Tom Green County John Doe, also known as White Sox, was found on November 15, 1987. He was nicknamed White Sox based on how he was found wearing upon discovery. Two boys were going fishing southwest of San Angelo, Texas within a remote nearby to the north shore of the Twin Boots Lake. Along their fishing trip in a field at the end of a college road, which was just off of Farm to Market 1266, the boys stumbled across the decedent in knee-high grass skeletal remains of an identified man. It was believed that he had been dumped in this area, as he was found without shoes hidden in the bushes yet his socks were clean. Based on DNA evidence, his race is mostly Caucasian and mainly of Spanish ancestry, with his closest match on Gid Match being from Colombia. It was also determined that the man had suffered from spina bifida, which means his spinal cord did not form properly. However, the man might have not known about this condition. He was missing two molars, yet had no significant dental work noted. After a re-examination in 2013, it was discovered that he had a 22 bullet hole noted on his skull. He was wearing size 34 by 30 Levi's blue jeans, size 34 jockey shorts, white socks. He is also undergoing testing by the DNA Doe Project. Now, if you believe that you have information on any unsolved cases, please do contact Lieutenant Terry Lowe at the Tom Green County Sheriff's Office at 325-655-8111. All the information for the Jane and John Does will be in the show notes. I am so grateful and thankful that there is many organizations that contribute their time and effort to identify John and Jane Doe's. Specifically, a shout out to the DNA Doe Project, which is a nonprofit initiative that uses investigative genetic genealogy to identify unidentified remains. Even though they've been around for five years, they have been the go-to organization for law enforcement agencies and medical examiners across North America. They have provided cutting-edge techniques that have led to amazing success, even with cases that the DNA was highly degraded or of low quality. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, how can you help? I've noticed continuous themes in regards to why there is so many unidentified Hispanic, Latinx, indigenous people. Families lose contact of their loved ones and not even know that they have passed on. Maybe they had a blowout or a huge argument. I get it. I've had many of those before. But for us to solve and to find their names, we have to work together. We have to put our differences aside. They are your loved one, a family member, Probably something that you can't even remember what you guys were arguing about or maybe you had indifferences. They are out there and they're waiting to be called home and to have their resting place. 
As you know, our family foundation starts at home, and it starts with our children. I remember many years ago that I used to attend events, and they would pass out these child safe kits. And I did some digging, and they are actually still actively doing this. We must be proactive. I hate to tell parents to think of the worst, but as you can see, this happens every single day. If your child is reported missing, there is a no cost child safe kit that can provide important information about your child, which saves valuable time in helping authorities to find them. Their website also provides a link for my Spanish speakers. They are called Child Safe Kits. I will have the link in the show notes. Another thing I know is pretty controversial, especially with the conflict of your belief or others, but placing your DNA in GEDmatch. GEDmatch is a free DNA comparison and analysis website for people who have tested their autosomal DNA using a direct-to-consumer genetic testing company. One of the examples is 23andMe. They have a simple, easy-to-use application. They test the DNA that you've downloaded in their DNA data file. Then they upload your DNA in the get matching process. Lastly, they make comparisons by exploring, matching, and comparing reports of other DNA tools. And because GEDmatch aggregates files from all testing companies, your potential for matches are greater. I will have their link in the show notes. Another cool thing that I did some digging in is an app called Selfie Forensic ID. Now, we use our social media all the time, but have you ever thought of how valuable that is as an investigative tool in searching for missing and unidentified persons? And yet, there's no forensic app that exists that aims of assisting the human identification process. One of the cool things that I read on National Library of Medicine, National Center for Biotechnology Information on NIH, Selfie Forensic ID employs selfie and face photographs as an archive of dental data and dental features of the front teeth of missing persons Sharing with Instagram, Tumblr, and Twitter social networks, this is a free download from either an Android or Apple store. One of the huge pointers in forensic investigation is the teeth. Our teeth are like our own individual fingerprint. There is actually a forensic case in utilizing this smile photography or dental antemortem data collection was used to solve a human identification case, describing the use of selfie photographs to identify a carbonized human remains published in a report paper of 2016. Forensic dental identification is performed through a comparison of postmortem dental data with antemortem dental profiles of missing persons. Forensic ontologists search this data from dental clinics and hospital x-ray images, dental casts, etc. I just think this is a fantastic idea. If you want to learn more about this, I will have the link in the show notes. Thank you for listening to Hands Off My Podcast. If you are enjoying the podcast and you'd like to support the mission, I do have a Patreon membership that will help the cause and bring more detail on cases and stories from the people of color community. If you yourself has a lost loved one or a story suggestion, please don't hesitate to contact me at email. Hands off my podcast at gmail.com. And if you are only able to support in another way, please give this podcast a five star rating on Apple or Spotify and continue to listen to upcoming episodes every Thursday, wherever you listen to your podcast. Dios te bendiga.